Hello, welcome back. It is week 28 here on Out on That Line. I'm Jeff with my co-host Alex. Alex, how you doing this week? I'm the leprechaun. You guys like Wayne's World? We are recording on St. Patrick's Day, March 17th, for those that are unaware. Uh, just found out today that apparently St. Patrick was actually Italian. So Italians will wear red in protest on St. Patrick's Day. Funnily enough, I wore red to work today. Did you do it on purpose? No, I guess it's just my uh, Italian heritage spoke to me through space and time without my knowing it. Maybe you had a dream last night. Maybe, maybe. Wear something the color of marinara. (laughs) Speaking of dreams, some Kings of Leon fans' dreams just came true recently as they released their first album in five years this year. So we're going to be going over that. Uh, The album's called When You See Yourself. But also, as we record this, a few nights ago, a little award show you may have heard of, the Grammys, occurred. Um, There were a few notable situations on that Grammys. First of all, I will say it was the best Grammys I've ever watched. And I say that with zero sarcasm, um, no qualifiers, nothing. It was a very, very good show, heavy on the music performances. They had, I think, just about every best new artist, a little profile on them. It was just really well put together. Um, I didn't scrape my eardrums out hearing Trevor Noah's jokes. Um, In fact, he made a hysterical one after the performance of WAP from Cardi B and Megan Thee Stallion. Uh, He said, we got to go to break. We got to dry the stage out. (laughs) That's good. That was a very, very, very good joke. Didn't know that one was going to slide by on CBS. Surprised they let that one go. But very funny. Um, That performance, I'll tell you, buddy, was something else. I'm sure you've watched it by now. I actually haven't. I hear tell. I oh. was. I heard that they got away with a lot, and I said, <laughs> okay, I'll find this later. Uh, yes, uh, well worth it. I think you're going to be a big fan, my friend. Excellent, excellent. That's what I like to hear. <laughs> yes. <laughs> we also had some out-on-that-line alumnus that won some awards. Thundercat took home the Best Progressive R&B album for It Is What It Is previously reviewed here on out on that line fiona apple with fetch the bolt cutters won best alternative album previously reviewed here on out on that line as well as megan the stallion won best new artist and we of course reviewed her seminal debut album good news earlier on out on that line so i i would say maybe we got some good taste here alex at least according to the academy I would say not just that we have good taste, but that we're taste makers, if you want my honest opinion. I think, yeah, just get in our wake, everybody. It's going to be easy swimming from there. We'll pick the songs for you. We'll pick the music. You just listen to what we talk about, and you're going to be just fine. Yeah, let us tell you how to feel and what to like and what to think, and it'll just be easier for you. Yes. Now... The Silk Sonic performance. Right after you watch Megan Thee Stallion and Cardi B, Silk Sonic's performance of Leave the Leave the Door Open was unbelievable. It was every bit of 70s that you could ask for. It was just simply perfect. You know, what's funny is, you know how sometimes you have to hide vegetables in a child's tater tots or mac and cheese or something, mm-hmm. you know? That's what I think Silk Sonic is doing with the smooth, because you're all in on Silk Sonic. That is smooth music, 100%, full stop. It is smooth music. So you yeah. technically like the smooth, Jeff. I hate to break I it g- to you. I guess you're, you're right. I mean, it, it's, it's hard to admit, especially to myself. Um, if there's anybody that has a high opinion of me, it's me. And admitting that I've been, I don't want to say wrong, but I've, I've been not, uh, not considering that I might like this music for a lot of years. Um, a lot of years. And you're right. It is very smooth. I get a lot of soul from it as well. I think that's the angle that maybe I'm, I'm kind of wiggling myself into this one with. Um, but man, oh man, just if you hunger girl, we got fillets. <laughs> I'm I telling mean, you, it's Jeff, just so good. It's just a hop, skip and a jump from there to Michael McDonald, baby. Just you wait. Oh God. They're probably going to have somebody like that on the album too. I mean, Thundercat already did it. I think I mentioned he and uh, he had Michael McDonald and Loggins do "Show You the Way," mm-hmm. and it's smooth as all fuck. Ah, I bet it is. Ugh. I used to watch a lot of uh, Daryl's House. I think was what it was called. Live from Daryl's House. 
live from Daryl's house. Yeah, I used to watch a lot of that. That was pretty good. Oh, God, what a slippery slope. I should have never done this podcast. Well, and technically, yeah, that's your mistake, buddy. Technically, <laughs> hollow notes aren't necessarily... They're, they're, they're some smooth, but they're pretty rocked up in a lot of places, too. So they're, like, on the periphery of smooth. They're smooth adjacent. Okay. okay. So your Daryl okay. Hall experience doesn't necessarily qualify you. Okay, we'll see. We'll we'll see when we get to the episode with you and Tanner and the list that you come up with. I haven't seen anything yet, by the way. We're holding on to no that. Movement. Okay. It's going to be a sexy bloodbath. He okay. he has a very full schedule until uh, the college he works at, until they have their commencement. So we're probably not going to get to the follow-up until the summer, but that gives the two of us plenty of time to load up the boat, baby. It's Yacht Rock season. Oh, man. Idle hands can be my worst nightmare. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so the other thing I, I did hear about, uh, I almost said the Oscars, the Grammys, <laughs> um, another friend of the pod, the delightful Phoebe Bridgers, got fucking skunked. She got skunked. She didn't win a damn thing. She, you know what? Just being nominated is an honor. <laughs> <laughs> did did that sound believable? It was very authentic, very sincere. Well done. <laughs> I uh, it is disappointing. It's disappointing, but the one where I I really struggled was best new artist because you had mm-hmm. Megan The Stallion, Doja Cat, and Phoebe Bridgers. <laughs> that was like Sophie's choice for me. What do you What do you do? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, what what are you supposed to do there? And that that was the thing too, is you know she's gonna lose to anybody in that category. You know, I think Megan The Stallion was the only one that I could really be okay with. You know, Doja Cat, I would have been like, okay, well, it's good she won something. I don't know if I really would have been able to convince myself that she deserved it over Phoebe Bridgers. I think Megan The Stallion is the only one there that I would have considered. You know, maybe it's a toss up between her and Phoebe Bridgers. For That's, who fair. Get it. That's fair. That's yeah. fair. The cat. The cat is almost like she's mainstream but she's almost novelty. She's like weird owl with a big ass. <laughs> that I mean, the song what's it called? Moo? Yo yeah. Where it's like I'm a cow. Bitch, I'm a cow. I am not a cat. I do not say meow. <laughs> yeah, that's that's some weird owl stuff. That's a great way to put it. I don't know if she'd be quite so flattered with that, but maybe she's weird enough to to think that's great. We'll find out. <laughs> and I do much to our chagrin, I hesitate to even mention this on the pod, but we were so close to Taylor Swift getting skunked in this Grammys. After a year, she released two albums. We were so close. And then she won Album of the Year for Folklore. I said it before, Jeff. I'll say it again. Taylor Swift is an institution and you can't fight City Hall. I think we were fucked from the start. Yeah, there was no getting around that. The problem is that the albums she was up against, there weren't any that were like really knockout albums that you that you consider would would beat her out. Um, Women in Music Part Three from Hyam was in there. We obviously consider that a great album. In fact, we reviewed that on an earlier episode of oh. Out on That Line. We sure did. Um, Future Nostalgia from Dua Lipa. We haven't done that one on the pod, but that's, I have listened, I've to, listened it. to. Yeah, I've listened to that one. Uh, fiance of the Pod, Marla is a is a big Dua Lipa fan, and I, I'm big Dua Lipa, pro Dua Lipa. I think we're both a, a pro Dua Lipa, Dua Lipa podcast here. Yeah. Um, and then Hollywood's Bleeding by Post Malone, which I thought was a pretty good album. Yeah, but again, not one that's really gonna, you know, overtake Taylor Swift. I think the name. As bad as the album was, I think the name was what was going to carry her. Maybe. Yeah. Yeah, because I can see that. First of all, I looked at the voting body. I'm like, who decides these things? Who votes on these things? Mm-hmm. And like, it's not a People's Choice Award. It's not like we have any say. It's the movers mm-hmm. and shakers in the music industry. And Taylor Swift is just too profitable not to add to the legend, to the folklore yeah. of Taylor Swift, if you will. Yeah. And apparently, she is the only artist or maybe only female artist i'm not sure which um to win three album of the year grammys apparently no one else ever has ever done that great great but beyonce set the record for most grammys by anyone ever actually did it 
Well, yeah, that's she, like 28 or something like that. She didn't have an album come out this year. What did she win for? Savage? Uh, she had uh, Black Parade came out this year. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, fuck. I slept on that one. At least, in, yeah, because they only released it on Tidal. Oh, gross. Yeah. Like, how do you, I mean, I don't, if any, people aren't aware of what Tidal is, it's Jay-Z, Beyonce, I think Kanye was involved with it at first. There's a bunch of artists. It's a bunch of big name, A-list musical artists, and it's supposed to be a competitor with Spotify, Apple Music, all those there. But you constantly see it on sale at Best Buy for like 49 cents a month for like the first three months. Like they are trying real hard to get people to use this program because nobody is. It doesn't offer anything that the others don't other than some artists that you don't get other places. But also, wasn't it like when it first rolled out, they were trying to get people to pay like 20 bucks a month for something for it oh, or yeah. some shit like that? Yeah. Yeah. It was like you pay $20 a month or there was like a yearly price you could do that knocked a little bit off per month, but it's still like way more. I mean, I think Spotify is up to like 15 bucks a month now, but I, I feel like the experience is so much better with Spotify. You know, I, cause I've tried title and it's just like the same as Apple music for yeah. me. Just like not as good as Spotify. That's a no from me on title. That's the official line. Yeah. We are anti title podcast, Correct. but funny enough, pro Beyonce pro jay-z podcast yes I don't know how that works i would consider myself adjacent to the hive yeah the bee yeah hive. that's this is the case where we love the artist but not the art instead of the other way around yeah i like that yeah that's well put yeah thank you uh what do you say we get moving right into the featured album for the week kings of leon let's do it when you see yourself all right so this is like i said before they hadn't come out with an album in like five years and so they're all brothers except for one guy in the band i think right i thought it was four guys they were all brothers they're like the terwilligers or something like that okay so the guy that they have playing piano is not part of the band proper it's just the follow wills the four follow wills oh follow will i I thought it was something like father gill or (laughs) or chestershire i don't know the follow will four that's what they should have named themselves well, for the longest time, I thought Kings of Leon were British. I didn't realize they were from Nashville. Mm. Just assumed yeah. they were Britpop. Goes that, to could, show I, me. that could fit. I mean, I, I, does, I guess it does sound like he sings with an accent. It kind of does. So I was yeah. very shocked when I'm like, wait, they're from Nashville? Fuck. Yeah, they're a good old American rock and roll band, my Pretty friend. Goddamn right. Yeah, goddamn right. Shuck them up. Um, so, <laughs> so they start right out. Um, and I. I think he had had some pretty severe like alcohol issues, the lead singer Caleb Followell. Um, so a lot of this album, I think, is kind of touches on those things, you know, his journey over the last five years since that last album. Um, and they were kind of at the top of their game. You know, they were they were very, very popular band. And then all of a sudden they just stopped making records for a while. So this is the first one in five years. And overall you know i would say it's just about as good as anything else they ever did you know it kind of dragged a little bit in spots for me but overall you know i felt like this was a good solid kings of leon album yeah this was and i know as far as my involvement with kings of leon i really liked mechanical bull and i know a lot of people were lukewarm on that Mm -hmm. um so people considered it too much of a departure and i'm like i don't really see that but okay um but i'm not like the biggest kings of leon fan in the world right really Mm -hmm. enjoy their music but i can't tell you everything about them obviously evidenced by the fact that i'm like they're not british (laughs) um but the the conversation around this album is really really fascinating to me Mm -hmm. so i guess to jump into the review proper in the first song yeah let's do it um this is kind of what jump started the conversation for me. I tried to go in unspoiled. The only thing I had heard was friend of the pod Tanner was like new Kings of Leon. It's really good. Uh, it's just like the old stuff. And I was like, okay, that's really the only indication mm-hmm. I had of where this was going. And that's very true. It is just like the old stuff. And I listened through it. I'm like, yeah, this 100% is their sound is their style. And it, it's nice. It's like a warm blanket. But mm-hmm. then you read some of the reviews, and not that this changes my opinion, it's just an interesting counterpoint, but like Pitchfork, which has kind of become my go-to, for no yeah. other reason than I just kind of like the format, I like the ranking system, whatever. Mm-hmm. They savaged it. They gave it a four. Wow. And they were like, it's just a sound that 
the band has outgrown and it's not cute and cheeky anymore. They need to grow and evolve. So that's an interesting question that I think has been put to this entire album and this song mm-hmm. in general, which is at what point are you a one trick pony? And at one point are you in the pocket? You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Yeah. That's in, and that's a very good point. You know, I haven't read any reviews on this one because I, you know, I might do it sometimes if it's somebody that we had no previous knowledge of or anything like that, just to give myself a little more context for what I was hearing. Um, with Kings of Leon, I had plenty of context. You know, I'd listened to a ton of it before. I think more along the lines of like you though, where I'm not a huge super fan of them or anything like that, but I, I have enjoyed what I heard before and I've heard a lot of their music and I think it's like, look at, I guess trying to think of bands like, you know, Iron Maiden didn't really evolve their sound. They're still one of the most popular bands on the planet. As far as like tour revenue goes, the Rolling Stones never evolved their sound over 50 years. You know what I mean? So it's like, where do you draw the line of like when it's okay to not evolve your sound versus when you should. And I don't know if I I really don't think I agree with the fact that they think they should evolve their sound if they want to fine but it's not as if there's a ton of other bands i think that are sounding like this either like you're gonna know a king's leon song as soon as you hear it and i think there's a value in that too i think there's absolutely value in it and i'm more playing devil's advocate with the question than than taking a firm stance because yeah you look at something like uh when metallica went alt people didn't know what to fucking do with it Mm -hmm. so it's an evolution of the sound and maybe that's more genre hopping than getting more experimental within your genre Mm -hmm. but i mean people throw out oh it's the most xyz since dylan went electric yeah i mean big paradigmatic shifts in your sound in the music industry will be lauded or you will never work again and then you have Mm -hmm. to backtrack and go back to your sound but by then everyone's like ah who gives a shit and you it's kind of a no win which is a hard yeah. position to be in, especially for a band like Kings of Leon who hadn't come out with an album in five years. Yeah. And I think they're going to, you know, they probably aren't going to worry too much about what critics think about it. I mean, they've been doing it for long enough now, probably longer than that pitchfork writer has been reviewing music. So yeah. they're probably not going to take that much into account. And I hope they don't, you know, it's not, you know, I don't know if Kings of Leon is ever going to be my absolute go-to band that I listen to, but I don't think I'm ever going to be upset when I hear a Kings of Leon song. You know, I just think they're, like you said, I think they're more on the side of in the pocket and not really stuck in any sort of, you know, time period or anything like that. You know, I definitely see it as like, that's just the kind of music they play. And if they play it well, let them keep playing it. Yeah. And whether they intended to or not, whether it was a conscious decision or not, I think the first song, which I keep, for some reason, not naming. So (laughs) when you see yourself, are you far away? Mm -hmm. Um, It encapsulates, I think, that argument, which is about introspection. So when you sit and seriously think about who you are and what your values are and what is the sum total of your being, how much distance do you have from your ego and Mm -hmm. how other people perceive you? You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So it's an interesting question to pose in the first song on the first album you've done in five years. But again, intentional or not, I applaud that as a choice because it's setting up the entire album to kind of be an identity struggle, at least as I interpret it. Maybe they were way more solid in their identity. There's one song down the pipe that Mm -hmm. I can say for certain because I read up on like their thoughts on it. They struggled with it for a long, long time. So I think they're very aware that they need to come up with fresh material, but they're not interested in moving too far from their sound. But it's always worth auditing where you're at in life, and that's kind of what this song is about. Yeah, and and I said in my notes, I said basically exactly what you did about kind of setting up the question that they ask that leads into the rest of the album. And it's, you know, I think it is, you know, it's a great point to bring up about it being about the ego and kind of when you look at it, you know, what mindset are you in when, when you're looking at that? Um, You know, I think with his struggles and everything, and I think he's clean now, I think it's a struggle that he's had, but I think he's clean now. So that always leads to a different perspective as well. So 
you know, this idea that they needed to drastically change their style of music or anything like that. I'm not sure about that. Mm -hmm. I do think their lyrical style has changed. You know, I think the subjects that he's writing about in this album were not ones that he wrote about previous to this. You know, I think it's, I think, you know, maybe their evolution is in the subject matter, not necessarily the style of music, you know, and I think maybe, you know, they should get some recognition for that. Yeah. And as a spoiler, I will say mixed results on their lyrical efforts on this album for me. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. It's, I think he's also kind of notorious for not telling people what things are about. And Hey, that's totally fine, but it's like the Nirvana argument I made in the Foo Fighters episode. You have to know what you're talking about. I have to believe that you believe it. Yeah, I can't just yeah. be words. And I can at see it. where you, I can see where you're coming from with that. Yeah, um, because moving into the next song, the bandit, um, you know, he said it was inspired by, you know, kind of what you and I would consider some of our outlaw heroes, you know, Towns Van Zant, Willie Nelson, and trying to construct this story. And the explanation about the song, I think, gave me more insight about what it was supposed to be than the actual lyrics did which is a problem to your point yeah that goes to your point of saying you know lyrically it could have been stronger thematically very easy to pick up and understand but you know if you're trying to kind of parse a storyline out of any of these songs it's very difficult to do because it's very stream of consciousness the way that he writes his lyrics and And they sound good but they're tough to analyze yes and especially with this song it, it is it's great lyrics the imagery of I mean, just the like the color red, it's a hunt. So think about like a fox hunt. Willie mm-hmm. Nelson was a redhead. The red door, which is a traditional sign of like welcoming, you're safe here, traveler. Um, mm-hmm. The red horse for war. Um, a lot of like sumptuous imagery, I guess, as douchey as that makes me sound. <laughs> sumptuous. But, mm. so, so sumptuous and creamy. <laughs> but uh, it... it it obscures the theme a little bit at first glance just because it and and it hammers these certain things over and over again and at first i'm like is the bandit a metaphor for something or is it just that straightforward it turns out it mm-hmm. is yeah it it's it is as straightforward as a bandit and a bounty hunter who are kind of locked in this eternal chase which is fulfilling for them. And I don't know what either of them would do if they, you know, ever did actually yeah. meet up. And I like that. I like the whole Jean Valjean and Javert complete ideological differences. We both think we're doing what's right. We're both mm-hmm. trying to make a living. We're total nemeses, but we're equals. That's a very compelling theme and a compelling story and a compelling mm-hmm. image. It just took me a minute to get to all that. Yeah, and I think it would have been stronger here. And I'm not saying that you always have to finish a story. You know, there, there. It's always it's fine sometimes to leave something to the imagination that you know us as the listener, or if you do it on on screen, us as the viewer will be able to make our own conclusions about what happened. Like the end of Sopranos. You know, it's always a hotly debated subject about what exactly happened at the very end of the show. But I think with this, unless you're going to be a lot more specific with the storytelling in this, you need to have a conclusion, you know, something that kind of brings it all full circle instead of just expecting people to parse out that this is about, you know, that struggle between two people that are, if they ever meet, you know, they, that what they live for is the chase, you know, and if they ever meet, they're not sure what they're going to do. Try to explore what might happen if they do. You know, and I think it would make for a little bit more of a compelling storyline through this one. Yeah, because, again, this idea of, well, if you read the behind the scenes, it makes more sense. You can't do that. It's like Mm -hmm. when they make a Star Trek movie and you go, I don't understand where Captain Gleeble Gleeble came from. And it's like, oh, you have to read the tie in comics to know. And it's like, no, no, I wanted to see the movie. I don't have time to read the comics and go on the forums and stuff like that. I wanted to see the movie. Just let me see the fucking movie. And I don't have that level of ire for this song, but it, it created a little distance. And like you said, it felt unfinished. It felt like this was building to maybe that moment where Mm -hmm. they meet up and they go, what the fuck? They have an existential crisis. What was this all for? Yeah. One of them kills the other and is like, well, now what? There are plenty of directions you could have taken it. I think of 
Jeannie Needs a Shooter, Warren Zevon. That's a complete mm-hmm. story. I met a girl. We were going to run away together, and her dad found out and kidnapped her and shot me in the belly. Complete yep. story. And it doesn't always need to be that spelled out, but this did just kind of feel unfinished to me a little bit. Yeah. Musically, great. Great stuff. Musically awesome. Yeah. yeah. Musically, this was them at the top of their game, but you know, it's it's like you were like you like we've been saying, you know, just imagine Johnny Cash is a boy named Sue, without the end where he met his dad yeah. and the conclusion of what happened to them. You know, and it, and not saying that this is as good as that song or anything, or it would be if it had that conclusion, but it's just that that sort of mindset that if you know trying to get across to the listeners, what what we're trying to convey here is like just lopping off the end of an iconic song that has a good conclusion and, and what you're left with is just the lead up, which is still fine to listen to, but there's not a lot to sink your teeth into. Yeah. They pose too open-ended of a question for my taste, I guess. Yes. And moving through, um, they have, the next song is 100,000 people. Um, we'll just move quickly through. It's about his father-in-law going through dementia. So that's pretty, pretty heavy song. Um, was not one that we chose to go real in depth with, but we did pick stormy weather. Um, and that was one of your picks, actually, Alex. So why don't you let me know why? Yeah, and, and to quickly double back to 100,000 People, that song is a great example of the identity crisis that happens on this album. It's <laughs> it's literally talking about someone who, like this concept of like strangers, and is the stranger someone they knew and no longer recognize? Is it a literal stranger? Um, it's a lot of identity struggle and and having that one thing to hold <clears throat> excuse me to hold on to um kind of reminiscent of the notebook as well um mm-hmm. great song obviously we didn't pick it but i again i just want to mention that it's a great building block to the identity issue which mm-hmm. unfortunately gets frustrated by stormy weather which again sounds so fucking good the mm-hmm. bass. I don't know which one of these motherfuckers plays bass, <laughs> but pay that man his money. Jared, brother Jared, follow Will. Well, let me tell you something. He went to Jared, and his playing is a jewel. He is <laughs> so fucking good on this album, but on this song especially, he is all over the fucking map. It's tremendous. Yeah. This is a song that sounds fucking amazing and it is about goddamn absolutely nothing. Mm-hmm. I just like let me let me read some choice selections to yes, the folks yes, at please. home. Running like a bull of Pamplona, try as I might to control you. You're like smoke in my eyes. Close every time. Face of a star child born in a sea a mile high. Never seen a bad moon rise. It's the right time now. Oh, I would go ahead and say that is a Dave Grolian type lyric. Oh, yeah. Oh, it's yeah. Jumping all over the place with metaphor. You're the moon. You're smoke. You're a star child. You're a bull. Like, you got to fucking pick something and give us enough to hang on to because this is just word salad. Yeah. Tell us why you're a bull. Tell us why you're a star child. You know, it's like, give us, it's, so many of the songs, I think there's the context missing. And I think that's what they need is that thread that'll tie everything together. They just seem to forget it. And musically, there's not a problem on this album. You know, no. those, those bros can rock for sure. And Caleb Followell is a great guitar player too. But lyrically in the songwriting, I think is really where it falls short. If you're going to give this album a criticism... Musically, there's not much to criticize. Lyrically, there's quite a bit. Yeah, and see, Andy Kuzman, we're fair. Like, we love <laughs> Kings of Leon, and we're shitting on them for doing the same thing Dave Grohl is guilty of. So put that in your pipe <laughs> dropping, and smoke it. Dropping government names, I like it. You beautiful bitch, I love you. <laughs> I miss you. I want to hold you again. But anyway... <laughs> Um, he probably, he probably stopped listening after the Foo Fighters episode. <laughs> yeah, I might have. He might have. <laughs> probably done with us. <laughs> Andy, give us a wink and a nod if you're still listening. Bark twice if you're in Milwaukee. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I mean, I don't know. I don't have much more to say about this song other than it was a great example, especially when juxtaposed with 100,000 people, of what is done really well on the album. I probably should have picked 100,000 people. <sighs> 
But I'm thinking maybe. <laughs> it's it's just such a heavy song with heavy subject yeah. matter and like I was a little wary of that, but it's such a like complete, coherent, really kind of beautiful song. And they follow it up with like glebo glabo gloop beep bleep bleep bloop. Yeah. Like I it just there's no meaning to this song, which for me hampers my enjoyment. I realize you can like Pigeons playing ping pong. If you shave my kiwi, then babe, I'll squeeze your lime. What the fuck does that mean? Sounds <laughs> sexual to me. But you can yeah. still enjoy the song. It's just for me on this song, the the lack of coherence lyrically hampered my enjoyment. Yes. Yes, for sure. And actually, I'm seeing, I'm looking at the credits here, and last on the list is Dave Grohl on this one for the, for the writing credits. I, I 100% believe that you're kidding. But there is a part of me that is very apprehensive. Yes. And that's about as bad of a review as we can give for this song, I think. Wow. It's not actually on there. But the fact that it was even 1% believable, that's a problem. Not this time. We made it up. (laughs) Oh, man. I should have given the Skimbo callback on that one. Little crossover bit. Shit. Okay. Next time. I'll get him next time. Um, And speaking of next time, the next song is... A wave and this was one that i chose and specifically because of the music when the beat drops into this one and it really gets cooking is really really tasty mm-hmm. you know there's there's one thing that kings leon is always going to be able to do and i think that is play the shit out of a slow burning rock song they've always been kind of on the forefront of it you know people probably listen to sex on fire pretty good song use somebody pretty good song as well and they do that you know kind of start out a little slower and then really get it cooking by the middle of the song this one does exactly that and it's i think specifically about his alcohol issues you know kind of picked out it's again like we've been saying it's a little hard to decipher specifically what he's talking about a lot of times but when he says i'm drying out in this weather feeling of parasites that kind of tells me drying out getting sober and I think when he gets personal like this is when this album is at its best. Yeah. And this was the one I was referring to earlier where they tinkered and tinkered and tinkered. They had one concept of it when they came up with it and it just wasn't working. So they change a part of it and they'd go back and do it again. And it just wasn't working. So they change another part of it. They worked really long and really hard on this song. And I think it shows Um, again, I wasn't like, dazzled by the lyrics mm-hmm. but I, it was it wasn't an active impediment to my enjoyment of it um i just i i think the time that they spent on getting this right musically was absolutely worth it this yeah. song is fucking pristine do not change a goddamn beat it is so good and it rocks so hard and it's got that surf rock dna which is mm-hmm. usually just little surfer girl like (laughs) not this time like they they put it on steroids it's it's a a tremendous song yeah it's very good and you know he has lyrics like the roses thorn still reaches out to pierce my skin it grows me warm and cloudies up my mind obviously talking about he wants to drink because it grows him warm and by clouding up his mind he doesn't have to think about things that bother him you know so he's got very you know it's very easy to pick out exactly what he's talking about in each part of this song might not tell a whole story necessarily from like a beginning middle end kind of standpoint but it does make a point and one that i think is easier to pull out of this song than most of the others on the album yeah i would agree and this was like the album was starting to get saggy diaper on me a little bit Mm -hmm. and this brought me back yeah so yeah and (laughs) and speaking of that basically going to skip through the next three (laughs) after Mm -hmm. this one. Um, So it's Golden Restless Age. Um, I thought a cool lyric in this one, not really sure what exactly it means, but you're only passing through a form of you. thought that was pretty cool. If I ever find out what it means, it may get cooler. Who knows? Um, But in Time in Disguise, seems to be about temptation, how abstract it can be that if you're always tempted by everything, then, you know, how can you pick any one thing? Um, Song Supermarket kind of likens the sobriety journey to an actual adventure, you know, like Don Quixote going to get himself sober kind of deal. Um, But then we move into Claire and Eddie. And this was the one I think that you had chosen, correct? Correct. Okay. So this one is about. So it's 
got these environmental themes to it, and it ostensibly is about a guy or a girl who falls in love with Mother Nature personified. Um, what I really liked about it, and this is going to sound totally fucking bizarre, but it reminded me of a more grown-up, thoughtful paint with all the colors of the wind. Mm-hmm. Because it really is kind of this story about somebody's reckoning with our natural world and falling in love with all of the beauty and wonder around us. So it's very easy to walk out of your front door and be like, I do my fucking shitty job and I just want to get some Dunkin' Donuts on the way and fucking <laughs> throw my wrapper out the fucking windows and stank up my car. <laughs> and to to miss all the beautiful things around you. I mean, like in many ways we have as a society paved paradise and put up a parking lot. Thank you, Joni. Um, and you kind of, you can kind of miss the natural wonder all around you. And this is a song about putting that in perspective. And it's cool because it works like falling in love with the world mm-hmm. again and realizing it's worth and it's full of rich imagery, but it could also be about, two people using nature imagery to talk about how someone is untamable and they've been hurt. People are going to try to burn you down. Mm -hmm. It, it works on two levels, which I think is what is kind of the strength of it. Yeah, exactly. And I, and I think it's, you know, and they go, they pretty much hit you over the head with what the, with what the subject is. You know, the chorus is, Oh, fire is going to range. Fire is going to rage if people don't change. Oh, a story so old, still so original. Talking about, we've been talking about climate change for, you know, long, long time, decades now. But since there's been really nothing, or at least not a whole lot done about it, it's still kind of breaking news. You know, it's like, we got to do some shit about this. And I think it's it's cool that he draws those comparisons between a real life person to person relationship and then, you know, kind of his relationship with the outside world. And, you know, I think with sobriety that's part that's one of the things that i hear about a lot with people that that get sober is that all those things that they weren't paying attention to while they were you know under under the influence of whatever vice it was that they were under um it's you know he finally kind of opens his eyes and sees the world for what it is this beautiful place but you know his mind obviously has to find some flaws because it's what he does and so it's that kind of push and pull between how do you appreciate this person like be- before you like say, okay, well, we got to actually change here. We got to, you know, you're not doing well right now. You got to do a little better. And, you know, I think it was as far as subject matter, one of the easier songs to understand what he was talking about on the album. And it was just real, real joy to listen to. If you didn't even pay attention to the lyrics, it was also just, again, another strong one musically. It's just, it's kind of beautiful. And yeah, musically it's awesome. And it's got this like very, effervescent timeless sound to it for me personally it takes me back to the summer of 2009 uh i was living and working in maine i was doing a play it was Mm -hmm. the first time i fell in love with a gal (laughs) i I remember i was sweet on a lady um (laughs) and at like genuinely at, at 19 that was the first time i was ever in love and boy was i and we listened to a lot of music that sounded like this song and i would just be driving around these forested areas in Maine or like going to the beach and stuff like that. And just like hitting these little pockets where there weren't really any other people. Cause we only mm. wanted to be with each other. We just wanted to like have schmoopy time, which is not a sex thing. It's adorable. <laughs> um, but like, we just kind of wanted to do our own thing in nature. So it was like, I have a lot of very positive memories of, a lot of the things associated with this song and there's this great Mm -hmm. imagery of like bathe in the Colorado river and just get back to nature, rediscover pieces of yourself, realize how capable of love you are, realize what's happening to the person that you love. They're in Mm -hmm. danger. If it's mother nature or an actual person, like it's just a very thoughtful, methodical, beautiful song that, Again, after a three song lull, I'm like, ah, they're gonna crap out towards the end. Yeah. This this sucks. Brought me right back. Yep, it sure did. And actually, pretty strong finish, I think, because we move right into the next one, which is that we chose, which is the next song after Claire and Eddie called Echoing. Um, and this one, kind of an interesting 
little subject matter on this one. It's two people plotting to escape an institution Mm -hmm. together, specifically a mental institution. And, you know, I think it's not literally in, you know, for him, I don't think it's literally about two people escaping this brick and mortar building. You know, it's his addiction that he's trying to escape, you know, that, you know, kind of, he looks at as his cage as his, as the building that he's stuck in. So he's trying to get out of that and with somebody else as well has their own that they're trying to break through as well. And, you know, it's just, I think, very cool subject matter to think about it that way. And I think where his where it was so strong with Claire and Eddie, where it was about two separate things at the same time, I think you get that same sort of strength here in echoing. Yeah. And to dovetail back to one of our most maligned episodes, um, the my big criticism of the Haley Williams album mm-hmm. was that she just repeated herself over and over and over with no variation on the theme Mm -hmm. so it was just like i've been ruined by bad relationships and i've been tainted by love over and over again with no like real new i mean like in a screenplay they say every scene should provide you with new information something you didn't know before to advance the plot Mm -hmm. didn't happen in that album but with this it, it i with this particular song I found that idea of identity advanced in a new and different way. So Mm -hmm. you have a song that uses dementia as the vehicle for that. You have a song that uses environmentalism as the vehicle for that. Now we have one with mental health as the vehicle. And again, if you want to interpret it literally or not, that's up to you. But I think it's a really interesting idea that you have people who are damaged and are You've got outside forces. You've got other people who are trying to prescribe a better way to live. Mm -hmm. And obviously, if you're deeply disturbed and and mentally ill or you've attempted harm on yourself, you need help. But there is also something to be said for the fact that sometimes mental illness is inconvenient to the people that don't suffer it. Mm -hmm. And we just want to make you better and make this go away. And... For better or worse, it's a part of you that you're always going to carry, and you need to learn how to manage it, and it becomes a facet of you. Bill Hader, the actor, talks about how he personified his anxiety as a monkey, and when he feels anxious, he'll imagine the monkey sitting on his shoulder, he'll pet it, he'll talk to it, he'll feed it a peanut, and it'll Mm -hmm. go away. It never actually goes away, but he's learned how to live with this. So it's an important part of accepting yourself. All of that on top of this idea of bonding with somebody else who's going through the same thing. You're the only two people who have a frame of reference for this. And you can kind of give each other hope. So it's it's a song that's doing a lot of things. So again, real strong finish. Yeah, it was, it was very good. <clears throat> and I've actually realized that I think I marked too many on my page. For the songs that we chose, because I also have a mark next to the last song on the album, Fairy Tale. And I may be springing this one on you, but we got the time. We got the time. If you want to go over this one, because I thought this was a great album closer. Yeah. We got the beans, Mocha Joe. Take us away. Yes. Um, so it's very stream of consciousness. You know, there's no true chorus on this one. It's just very kind of like that Bob Dylan style where it's just verse after verse after verse after verse. You know, the only thing tying it all together is a theme. And I thought it was just a very, very good song. It kind of left where, you know, the first song, you know, when you see yourself, that that one kind of asks a question, leaves it open-ended. And I feel like it still gets left a little bit open-ended with this song, Fairy Tale, which I appreciate because it's one, it's something like that makes you kind of sit a little bit and take in the album as a whole. And Maybe you could look at that as a problem if there's not necessarily a strong resolution. We certainly gave that kind of criticism to some songs in the album. But I think overall, this song kind of closes it out well because it ties things together. But it also makes you wonder what's going to be next. Yeah. And and again, that's a question that's made all the more interesting because of the very nature of this album. Uh, Return to form after a five-year absence. So what is next? More of this? More of the same? 
Or are they going to go in a completely different direction? I'm sure everyone has different opinions on it, but Mm -hmm. that's why I kind of like the loose structure of this song because you're right. It was smart not to make a definitive statement. It's the same thing that Phoebe Bridgers did to close out Punisher. Just this like chaotic stream of consciousness, like frequently terrifying, uncomfortable song to end what became her calling card in the music industry, what got her nominated for a bunch of awards that she didn't win. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, I agree. I think this is a, this is a great closer. I'm big on having a hot open and a hot close and they, they definitely bookended yeah. this album. Well, yeah, they did a good job. I think for this one, it's going to get a stream it from me, you know, and I think take our criticisms, you know, take those to heart as well. But you know, overall, you know, I think this album is absolutely worth listening to. Yeah, I, I'm I'm very much pro stream it. I was really looking forward to listening to this. I was not disappointed. I have criticisms, but I can't even say like who's fucking garbage. Like mm-hmm. it's a, it's a stumble. People stumble again. I can't get through an episode without mentioning Frank Zappa <laughs> and how a lot of his input was not that great or his yep. out his output. Excuse me. So I mean, you you have to kind of take the good. You take the bad. Somewhere in the middle is the facts of life. Yeah. And, you know, and I think it's at worst, the album is still good to listen to. You know, at worst, the music's still good. So the lyrics might not do anything for you, but at worst, the music's still going to carry you through to when the lyrics start to, to do something for you again. So definitely check this one out, folks. Again, Kings of Leon, When You See Yourself, The Brothers Follow Will, after five years with a pretty strong effort overall. So I guess since we've got a little bit of time, just to close it out, yeah. Where do you fall in this debate? Reinvention, necessary reinvention versus if it ain't broke, don't fix it. I'm a big time if it ain't broke, don't fix it because I've been far more upset with bands when they've totally changed something about themselves. You know, I think Against Me is kind of the biggest glaring example that I can think of. Mm-hmm. Um, I've certainly kind of come around on you know White Cross's album. A little bit you know it started with new wave when they started to get really popular there were some songs on that i was like eh they don't sound too much like the crazy angry against me i'm used to certainly warmed up to it but you know that to me i think is a little bit more jarring when you're coming to a band for a specific reason and not saying that you just because i like a certain style means that band has to just do that style it's like i just might check out of listening to any further stuff if i don't like the way it went so for me you know i think if it ain't broke, don't fix it is, is certainly the way that I would lean on this. I would agree in terms of people with a very distinctive identity. Mm-hmm. And I mean, that can cut both ways. Like people say Steely Dan is an aesthetic more than a band, right? And their stuff all managed to sound wildly different while all being recognizably Steely Dan. Don't worry, Jeff. You'll learn when Tanner and I get you on that pod. <laughs> God damn it. <laughs> But um, and then you get like Elvis Costello, who did an entire country album. Mm -hmm. I mean, he he has experimented a lot with genres and to mixed results, quite frankly. So he's a good argument for putting yourself out there, earning the trust of your audience, (laughs) the album trust, but (laughs) earning the trust of your audience and not being afraid to fail. And album sales and critical response will let you know if this was worth pursuing. And again, you have to do what you love, but you aren't creating in a vacuum either. So I guess, you know, chase your instinct, but realize that there is a specific thing that brought you to the dance and you have to honor that in some small way. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what Kings of Leon are really good at doing is not fucking with the formula, but finding a way to incrementally advance the sound. So Yes, it sounds exactly like old Kings of Leon, and I wouldn't have it any other way with this album. Yeah, and I think especially something after five years, if they were popping them out every two years, yeah, you could expect maybe they start to change a little quicker, but it's been five years, yeah. you know, and they and they never really changed much in their previous album. So I don't know why people would think a hiatus would certainly do that. Um, so, you know, I think it's better this way. I would have been a little wary if they had just, totally morphed into like a like a pop rock band or something like that you know i think it would have been a little jarring to hear that because i just don't think they fit that style i think this is their style and this is what they should run with 
Yep, I agree. Yeah. Um, so I think that's going to do it for the album review. Um, definitely want to direct everybody's attention once again to the YouTube page. Um, I don't know if you've seen the numbers on the Julian Baker episode. Yeah, I mean, that one took off. Jesus Christ. Somehow, some way. You know, I don't I don't know how. I don't we're learning this process of, of what pops off on YouTube versus what doesn't. We're still very much learning because I haven't figured out why that one has exploded. You know, it was one of our most listened to videos overall. You know, everything has kind of been going up and up, which is nice, but that one just out of nowhere. Yeah, uh, hard to know. I guess it's just like a lot of Julian Baker stands that aren't getting what they want elsewhere, so they came to us. Yeah, well, they can keep coming to us. We'll keep we'll keep feeding that beast. Um, but too bad we were check like that out. Too bad we were like, ah, the album's okay. Yeah, I mean, at least we were fair, I suppose. That's true. Yeah, I don't know. I don't remember what segment we did at the beginning of that one, but that's probably enjoyable to listen to. Yeah, we didn't shit all over it. Yeah. So. Yeah, it's fine. It'll be fine. It'll, It'll be fine. Yeah. Uh, make sure you go on the YouTube, hit that subscribe button so that you get notified. Um, at, so we're recording today. So tomorrow, Thursday, will be our next episode six of our singles series. Um, so you'll be hearing this Monday. So that will already have been out. So if you haven't listened to that yet, go and do it. You can, in fact, stop the podcast right now and go watch that YouTube video. I would be absolutely fine with that. Um, let us know if you have anything specific, not only that you'd like to hear on the podcast uh, for those audience submissions, but we'll also take them for the YouTube, for the singles, or just a standalone video, whatever you want. Um, I did get a tweet requesting a Coheed episode from I did friend of the see pod, that. Ashley. Yes, I did see that. Yes, so we're gonna have to we're gonna have to do that. Um, there is a new prize fighter inferno album coming out fairly shortly which is claudio's kind of side project okay i was gonna say i have no fucking clue what that is but you sound excited <laughs> so j- quickly so in the coheed and cambria story the amory wars jesse is the prize fighter inferno the brother of coheed of coheed and cambria okay. in the whole amory wars universe he is the prize fighter inferno Got it. And it's okay. a it's a very complex, interesting story, but perhaps we can get more into that on an episode. I think so. I mean, we've got we've got a full slate here coming up. The next two weeks are planned out for us. We don't mm-hmm. want to spoil anything, um, <laughs> but some some real pain is coming down the pike, Ugh. and some real pleasure. And once yes. we get through that, I don't know. Maybe it's maybe it's Coheed and Cambria time. Yeah, time to man our man our own pod stations. Yeah, that's right. Yes. Um, we're still, even though we love this YouTube, we're still putting stuff out on Anchor, Spotify, Apple Music, wherever you get your podcasts, you'll be able to find us out in that line. You could send us a little something in our DMs on Instagram or Twitter. On Instagram, it'll be at out on that line. Twitter, at out on that line one. You could send us a nice little email out on that line at gmail.com. That email inbox is, is very lonely, folks. It needs a little love. So we love the DMs that we get everywhere else. But we need a little love in that email inbox. So even if it's just a love letter, that'd be fine. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I, I'm I'm single. I, I I I write some pretty questionable letters to some pretty questionable people. If you listen <laughs> to my other podcast, The Skimbo Lounge, you'll quickly realize what I'm talking about. So yeah, I could use some positive reinforcement. Go ahead and write to us. Yeah, you know, and and like I said in the previous episode, you know, we love us, so it's really nice to hear when people agree with us about that. So just get in touch with us any old way you feel like. Send a smoke signal, carrier pigeon. If you're if you're at Hogwarts, you could send me an owl. Yeah. You know, just just whatever it is, go ahead and let us know what you want to hear on the pod, and we'll try to get to it. Yeah. Well, I couldn't have said it better, and I have nothing else to say for this week, so that's it for me. Okay, excellent. Until next time.